Hi, my name is Ryan Yancey and I'm a ministry director with the Ontario Conference of MB Churches. Thanks a lot for this invite to share with you this Sunday. It's, it's an honor. It's too bad it's got to be by video and not there with you in person. But as some of you may remember, I did have the opportunity to connect with you folks there the first week of December. And I just want to say it was a real joy to be with you. Maybe I'm repeating what I said earlier, but I love what I see about you folks. I love seeing how you're engaging with your, your neighborhood and desiring to see people meet Christ. And I, I know it's, you know, it can be a chaotic road. It can be uncertain and and no doubt there are challenges along the way, but yeah, love what I'm seeing. So I want to want to encourage you, and uh, also want to say I, it is unfortunate that it's under these circumstances with David and Diana, and COVID hitting their household that I I have to share with you. But anyway, thanks for the invite, all the same, and I, I have been praying for their family these last number of days that uh, they'll have a speedy recovery, that God's presence will be with them, and yeah, they'll be able to hit the ground running again soon. Before I begin, I want to take a, just a moment to share with you a little bit about who the Ontario Conference of MB Churches are. We're made up of 33 churches and different expressions of mission across Ontario, so we're not a, a huge bunch. But yeah, 33 of us in partnership, multiplying disciples of Jesus together. My role as a ministry director with the ONMB Conference began in mid-October, so it's pretty new. And a significant aspect of my role is going to be in the area of church planting, new expressions of church, how to share the gospel on the margins. And uh, so I'm actually particularly interested in learning from you folks in, in terms of your, your journey these last couple of years. Uh, what's working, what's not working, how can we grow with our new expressions based on your experiences as a newer church plant. I work alongside Ed Wilms, our executive director, as well as Christy Lee, our executive assistant. They're a, a marvelous team to work with. I want to draw your attention to a, a couple of events that we have coming up that we would love to have you possibly plug in with. The first one is our annual convention. Now the, uh, the Saturday will be some business meetings, some pretty significant matters that we'll be discussing there so that we can partner well going forward. But the Friday evening, whether you're registered as a delegate or not, you'll be welcome to join us. Now we will be on Zoom this year, so you can do it from your own home. We really hope to be in person, but the way things have gone, that's not possible. And we'll be sharing a number of stories that evening. We'll be worshiping together. These stories will be about new expressions of church. And uh, we're going to be featuring you folks. Now, <laughs> I realize as I say it right now, I, I have not talked to David about this yet. That's on my to-do list for the coming week. So assuming that David's like, yeah, that's fine. We are going to be sharing the story about you folks and the favor that God has given you in your community and the development of the food bank space. Love it. It's just a great example of being the hands and feet of Jesus that we want to share. So I invite you to check that out. If you need the details, talk to David and uh, figure out how we, as a family of churches, are partnering for the good, extending the good news of Jesus here in Ontario. Another event that I want to draw your attention to is Posture Shift. This will be taking place in St. Catharines on March the 25th and 26th. And for all of us, in a variety of different ways, we have family members, we have friends, we have neighbors, perhaps ourselves, are, uh, who are a part of the LGBTQ plus community. And you know what? Often in the past, we as a church, we've not done well in terms of encouraging and caring for and discipling people or sharing the good news of Jesus with these people. And so this event is designed uh, in view of what the scriptures teach us, in view of God's vision for marriage and sexuality. But then within that, alongside that, how do we care for people with a more gracious posture and that's the that's a whole thing well how do how do we shift our posture even as we walk in light of what has been the historic view of the christian church i'm looking forward to it i've seen their examples and are there some of their stories i think it's going to be really challenging and uh, just a really good event for forming us in that way that will be in person so i don't know if you folks can swing it to come all the way down from ottawa but march 25th and 26th we would love to have you join in i also invite you to stay connected with the Ontario Conference of MB Churches. You can see our email address there. If you got anything you want to pass along, info at onmb.org. Track with us on social media, uh, Instagram or Facebook, both are at ONMB events. And then I also invite you to track with myself. As I serve in my role, I share various uh, stories that are happening in churches, various resources, different events that we have going on. 
And I'd love for that to be a means of me getting familiar with who you are as a church. You can follow me at Ryan underscore O-N-M-B. And uh, yeah, maybe even as you're sitting there, whip out your phone, do a quick little, quick little follow. I'd really, really appreciate that. This morning, I'm going to be sharing on the theme of going far together. So I, uh, I'll get to the, the scripture just in a moment here, but just to, by way of introduction, this past fall, I had a, a fairly significant project that I undertook, and that was moving a pig pen from the back of my yard up to my house. It was a distance of about 150 feet or so, maybe upwards of 200 feet. We raised a pig in the, in the back, and, and we have a country property, so there's a bit of space. We raised a pig in the back. We kept the pig back there because it was kind of stinky. We're not going to be raising one again. I thought, oh, it'd be really nice to have this shed up by the house so that we can keep our various, uh, you know, our lawn tractor and different tools and whatnot in there. But it's a bit of a distance. And so I thought, you know what, uh, I think I can swing this on my own. So I hatched this plan, which involved, I've got a little utility trailer, six feet by eight feet, backed it up with my van. I jacked up the, uh, the shed, and you can see in the image here, it's, it's not a big shed, but it's, it's pretty heavy. It was framed with two by sixes. So anyway, I was going to jack it up lift one end up onto the back of my trailer, and then we've got a heavy-duty kid's wagon. It's actually kind of an industrial grade, but I was gonna jack up the other and put it on this wagon. So I would pull it with my van and trailer, and then have one person steering this little wagon, and we'd get it up to the house. I knew it was a bit of a sketchy plan, and I remember being like, oh, I hope none of my neighbors notice, because this is gonna be, uh, yeah, I, I don't, don't necessarily want them interfering. Um, but lo and behold, I, as I had the first end jacked up, my one neighbor rides over on his lawn tractor, and I could tell the way he's looking at me that he wasn't too sure about this plan. I was like, oh my goodness, here we go. <laughs> and then my other neighbor comes over, and he's looking at things, and you can tell he's sizing things up, and the, and the wheels are turning, and they start asking some questions. And then, and then so my one neighbor's like, well, did you notice that if you do this, there's this tree branch up here that you're probably going to hit? And when you get to this ground, it's a little bit, bit uneven, and it's probably going to topple over. And if you, I, I don't think it's going to carry that, that little wagon that you have probably isn't going to carry the weight. He's like, I don't think this is a very good plan. And I was like, oh my goodness, just leave me alone. I can figure this out. My fault is that I can be a little bit of a, just give something a shot and ask questions later, fly by the seat of my pants. We'll see how it works out. And, but I, so I was, I was a little bit discouraged or frustrated to, to be honest, I was frustrated with them. <laughs> But I also knew that they were right. And so my neighbor, Steve, he hatched a plan. And basically what we did is we took a number of fence posts and we set them underneath the shed. And then I, I got some straps that I attached to the shed and I, I put around the hitch on my van and I pulled it and I pull it six feet and then it would roll over top of these posts. And I'd go back at the post at the back and put it at the front of the trailer and roll it a bit further across. And we inched it six feet at a time across my yard. And it took a bit of time, but it actually worked really well. I was actually glad that uh, this, this fellow with his life experience was able to uh, give me this guidance. And he actually helped me supply a couple of fence posts as well. And I use this as an example of on my own, I was going to go fast, but together we could go far. That's a, a, a a, a proverb that you may have heard. Now, this proverb depends where you look. It's it's attributed to certain groups of people at certain different times. And as I researched it, it looks like a mess of nobody actually really knows where this quote comes from. But the quote is, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And so that's what I experienced. I was going to get this done with my shed pretty quick, but I might not have got that far actually, but I was going to get to it but through the counsel of my neighbors and them providing insight, uh, them providing some fence posts and just the moral support at the end, they helped me kind of shimmy it, in, shimmy it into the final place as well. We were able to go far together. And I actually think that this proverb is an excellent uh, word of advice for us as the church of Jesus Christ. It applies to the people of God and it applies to you as Southeast City Church. I also believe it applies to us as a family of the Ontario Conference of Mennonite Brethren Churches. Let me share with you our scripture text for today. My, I almost said this morning, I know you folks meet in the afternoon. My, my apologies if there's any point at which I make reference to the morning. That's my usual frame of reference, but I know you, you folks meet in the afternoon. So I invite you, if, if you have your Bibles, uh, maybe you can pull it up on your phone to turn to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 16, starting at verse 1. Now about the collection of the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve, and I will send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey, wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has been opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you, for they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, I write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, let that person be cursed. Come, Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. I think actually that in this text, we see this proverb being lived out. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. As I proceed, I'm going to be sharing three different o and stories uh, throughout my, my message. Just as a way of getting familiar, a way of kind of envisioning how maybe we can go far together. And the first one is the story of Kyla Sinclair Peters. After growing up as a missionary kid in Southeast Asia, she now shares the good news in the GTA with a Buddhist minority population there. This particular people group, there's believed to be 10,000 of them in the GTA. This is believed to be the densest population of this people group outside of their homeland. And, and for uh, security reasons and uh, just freedom of mobility for, for Kyla, I will not be sharing the specific group. There are only believed to be 10 Jesus followers among these people in the GTA. And Kyla says that she's super passionate about these people having an encounter with Jesus so that a disciple-making movement can be birthed within their own cultural context. Kyla shares the story of a young fellow who, at 12, he was super kind, but he also had this feeling that everybody hated him. But eventually, he came to faith. God got a hold of him, and he said that he knew that Jesus was real because he felt the presence of Jesus inside him. Now, for him, the next hurdle was telling his family. He had a deep fear that if they found out that he had given his life to Jesus, that they would disown him. And so Kyla encouraged him, along with others, that to follow Jesus does not mean that he would have to leave his culture, that he would have to abandon his way of life. And so she connected this young man with other believers, and one of them prayed over him in their own dialect of language. And this is where the lights went on. And he said, you know what? I can be 
a member of this cultural group while placing my faith in Jesus. My spiritual, my worldview, my spiritual system are being transformed, but within this culture. And so he's growing in faith and he's becoming a leader in that community. And they saw a really big step for him when they had a kids program recently and he volunteered to pray out loud. He volunteered to invite these kids to, uh, yeah, to talk to God together. And, and Kylo was just so excited seeing this as a big step of his growth as a leader. Jesus is changing lives and we are seeing it um, through Kyla, through Multiply, who she works with, which is our MV missions agency and as partners within the MV family here in Ontario. One of Kyla's prayers is that she would have a few more people to come around her, to join her on her team. And so we as ONMB were asking this question of how do we partner with her well? How do we as churches partner with her so that we can be a people who go far together? And so as we think about ways that we can be partnering to go far together with Kyla, there are a number of ways through prayer for her, through finances, through sending encouraging notes, and maybe, just maybe, God would call one of us, several of us, to come alongside Kyla and to form a team so that folks would know the saving work of Jesus in their lives, that young leaders, that disciple makers would be raised up and sent out. Before I proceed into the specifics of this text that I just shared with you, I want to share with you another idea that I find is kind of a life verse for me, a guiding principle when I consider what it means to go far together. And that is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And it says, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the, real, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. So God's like saying, you know, how, how will I show off how wise I am? I want people to see and to understand that I am wise. What shall I do? And he decided he was going to do it through the church, through saving his people, through drawing this diverse group of people together into one spiritual family and doing his work in the world through them. I find this to be fascinating. I find it to be mysterious if I'm going to be truly honest, and clearly I don't have the wisdom of God, I would not have chosen this path. The church is a messy bunch. But this is how God decided to show his wisdom, was through the church. Let's play a part in this. We will. Whether you decide to or not, as a follower of Jesus, as a part of his family, he is showing his wisdom through you. But maybe we can live into it. Maybe we can embrace this reality. Let's go farther together as a display of the wisdom of God. And now at this point, I want to share another story with you from our ONMB family. And that's the story of B. Billy Joe is her name, but she likes to be called B. She said she only hears Billy Joe when she's in trouble. B is from Moose Deer Point, First Nation. B grew up in a, in a family and, and some, some family challenges along the way. And through the ministry of Derek Parento, who does First Nations ministry with Rugged Tree and just his patient, gentle presence, pointing people to Jesus. Uh, he found himself, actually she was in the hospital, and he found himself at her bedside, just sharing with her, praying over her, speaking words of blessing and truth when she was quite possibly at the lowest point. And it was through this investment in her that she discovered her identity as a child of God and has been growing in her journey with Jesus, growing in her identity as a First Nations woman following Jesus, and, and B, uh, she has a wonderful prophetic voice calling people to reconciliation. She understands the pain, the historical injustice that's been committed against First Nations people, and she understands the path forward. She has this vision for the path forward, not in a way that pits settler Canadians against First Nations people, but says, how do we join together as God's people? So I'm actually excited about the ministry that B has among us um, as a prophetic witness calling us to a new way forward. Now, B became our very first credentialed Mennonite brethren, uh, First Nation, credentialed with the Mennonite brethren as a First Nations leader. And this was quite a significant step for us. We retooled our credentialing process to fit a little bit more with the narrative 
uh, narrative-based understanding of First Nations people, you know, all the core components are there, but a narrative-based credentialing process to tailor to their culture and be as the first one to have completed that process. And we're just so excited in terms of what God has been doing in her and for the voice that she will be among us. Now, currently, B is serving with YWAM, with Youth with a Mission in Bristol, England. And you can see the picture there of her drumming uh, by the waterside. And there she's actually, she feels like God has called her to that place specifically where people left on ships to come and to colonize North America and affect her people in such negative ways. That in terms of her prophetic witness there in that place, that there's something significant that God is doing through her. So anyway, I encourage you, reach out to myself, reach out to David if you want to hear more of the story of, of B, but another glimpse into what it might look like for us to go farther together, being in relationship and learning from one another. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, which I shared with you a moment ago, things were moving and they were shaking in the early church. The gospel of Jesus was advancing through the Roman Empire to the the watching person in quite a surprising way. People were turning from their allegiance to Caesar and his worldly empire. They were turning to Jesus, giving him their allegiance instead. Freedom and hope were being found. And the Apostle Paul was on the leading edge of this. He was trekking all over, sharing the gospel, establishing churches, raising up leaders, moving on to the next place. And it's pretty clear that these churches were pulling together for the sake of the gospel, that this was a key value for Paul as he poured into them, getting them to relate to one another so that together they could go far, together they could advance the kingdom of Jesus. Now this text that I chose is not the most stimulating passage from the Bible. There's a pretty good chance that none of you have ever heard a sermon from 1 Corinthians 16. There's no massive zingers in there or, or even like a clear-cut central theme from this text. But I chose it because we see in this text that there were a lot of connection points between believers, between churches in different geographic areas. The kingdom of Jesus was advancing because these churches spread out were committed to going far together. And I think that it offers a good vision for what it might mean for us as the Ontario Conference of MB Churches to go far together. And I want to be very clear that as I share this, you know, because of my role, uh, I'm casting this from the particular advantage, vantage point of the ONMB conference. But I also know you are in relationship with churches in your city, in your immediate neighborhood. I, I heard, uh, is it called One City? I'm sorry, as I'm, as I'm sharing, I'm going off the cuff here. I don't remember the exact name, but there's a, an incredible organization in Ottawa of churches partnering together. I learned about this when I was with you a few weeks back. Just remarkable. And so I want you to receive a vision, whether it's within the MB family, other churches nearby other parts of the world. Overall, I want you, even as I express it in the MB circle, to have this vision for going far together with the Church of Jesus, wherever that may be found, in whatever form. So we see in this text that part of their going far together was providing for physical needs. Verse 1, it says, Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will need to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men that you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. And so it appears that the church in Jerusalem, the original mother church, where these disciples of Jesus emerged from, it looks like they were undergoing severe famine. Now what's interesting is Paul is speaking this to the Corinthian church, which was, was Gentile. In the early church, there was tension between Gentile and Jewish Christians. They would have been quite a bit different in terms of their culture and even in terms of how they expressed their faith in Jesus. And it wasn't easy. There was tension there. There were squabbles. And yet it's clear here that Paul was urging them to take up a collection, to send to Jerusalem, to help them through this hard time. When we as churches support one another in concrete, tangible, physical ways, it enables us to go far together. And so I see in this text an inspiration for going far together. What might this look like? Maybe if one of our churches had a fire or a disaster, it's our duty as spiritual family going far together to care for, to provide, to send money 
to one another. It's my understanding that one of our MB churches out in, uh, in the Fraser Valley of British Columbia, you will have seen in the news that there's incredible flooding there in the Sumas Prairie. So one of our MB churches, Arnold Community Church, their basement flooded. And they were actually on the leading edge of caring for their community needs. And as that happened, other MB churches gathered around them to help meet some of the physical needs for them with their facility. That's what it looks like, this going far together, meeting one another's physical needs. I think the second piece that we see here is this idea of supporting together those who are sent out. So verse 6 of chapter 16, Paul is saying, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. After Paul, so as Paul was roaming about on his missionary journey, he stopped to be with the church in, in Corinth. He'd been building a relationship with him, knowing that they would be a help to him. Now in that church, there were business people, there were tradesmen, maybe there were medical professionals, merchants, all kinds of folks who couldn't just go and hit the road sharing the gospel like Paul did. They couldn't help him, but they, so they couldn't go with him, but they could help him on his journey. And that was huge. That's something that we actually see in our churches all the time. Different mission projects, local, regional, global, and churches working together to support those who are sent out, providing finances, providing prayer, providing resources, cheering them on, encouraging them as they share the gospel. Multiply, our missions organization, facilitates this often. God is doing great work with initiatives that our individual churches could not do on our own, but when we band together, we can do them for the glory of God, supporting and sending out mission workers. This is what these churches were doing, sending Paul and other mission workers out to share the gospel. This is what it looks like to go far together. The third piece I see is raising up leaders. Verse 10, when Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you. For he's carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me. Timothy was a young leader who Paul had invested in. And there's evidence to suggest in other texts that, that Timothy was a little bit timid. That he was maybe a little bit fearful, perhaps because he was young. And here he is going out on his own. He's carrying out the work of the Lord, multiplying disciples, strengthening the church. He's doing this broadly with the various churches. And he's going to be coming to Corinth. And Paul's saying, like, treat him well. Send him in peace. Build him up as a young leader for the sake of the gospel. Again, there's lots of ways that we can do this together. Broadly, working together with our other churches to support and to send out young leaders, young disciple makers. As these leaders are raised up, we as churches, as a family of churches, have a mutual responsibility to build them up, to pour into them, as the church in Corinth was asked to do with Timothy. We enable them then to go farther. I'm a pastor today because another nearby church within the denomination that I was in at that time, I had a connection with this other church about an hour away, their pastor reached out and said, hey, would you be interested in doing your Bible college internship? Uh, here, shadow our pastor, we'll give you the space to, to learn and to grow and to explore your calling. And God did some real work in my heart at that point. I actually later, a number of years later, went to pastor with them. And that's actually the church that I just finished pastoring with this past October. And it's because they took this call to support, to bless, to raise up leaders they reached out across um, geography to another church. Anyway, I think it's, I've been the benefit of this living out of partnering together, going far together through raising up young leaders. In verse 16, we see that there was mutual learning happening. Verse 16, you know the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Acacia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labors at it. So an interesting note here, that there's this one guy, Fortunatus, that, that's a Greek name, which was often adopted by folks who were freed slaves at that time. Fortunatus means fortunate. 
So if you've been a slave, you're freed, you said, I'm fortunate, I want my name to reflect that, I'm going to take on this name now. So it's quite possible that Fortunatus, mentioned here, was a slave at one time. And Paul is asking the church to submit to a former slave. Paul is turning the social order upside down. This is so good. It's such a great outworking of the gospel of Jesus. So we've got new converts, and he's asking the Corinth church to submit to them and everyone else. Why is that? Well, it's because the Corinthian church needed to learn from these other believers. This is a glimpse of mutual submission. You folks in Southeast City, I'm sure you're a fine bunch. I know that God has given you a wonderful amount of gifting, but you don't have it all together. You don't know everything you need to know. You're not living in all the ways that you need to live to be faithful to Jesus. As marvelous as you are, you as Southeast City Church need the input. You need to be learning from other churches around you, in your city, other churches within the ONMB family. And so it is that other churches need to learn from you. That's a little bit of why we want to share this video of your engagement with the food bank at convention. Other churches need to learn from you. If we're going to go far together, we need to be in this relationship of learning from one another. And then along those lines in our text, we also see that there was diverse gifting at play. Verse 17, I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. They supplied what was lacking. There was something, again, this parallels with the point I just made. There was some way in which the church in Corinth didn't have it all together. They couldn't give Paul everything that he needed for his missionary work, so he needed other believers from another place to fill that out. I don't have everything in my role that is needed to encourage and to send out and to extend the kingdom of Jesus I need to learn things from you. I need gifting that you have. The whole, you know, the body of Christ has an arm and an eye and an ear and a head. All these different pieces that work together to complement one another. It's so easy as churches just to have our eyes on the ground. This is what we have to get done today. We have to run this neighborhood program. We have to prepare this sermon. We have to organize this Bible study. We have to care for this individual. And our eyes become locked on what's immediately in front of us. And we might get a lot of things done. And we might get a lot of things done fast, but we will not be healthy and faithful for the long haul. We will not go far. We need one another, one another to go far. The last piece that I see in our text here is an instance of mutual encouragement. Verse 18, for they, which is referring to Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, they refresh my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send your greetings, send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers and sisters here send your greetings. This is fascinating to me. These leaders in these churches that are scattered, you know, they didn't, like, I can can jump on Instagram and see what you folks are up to. I can see what other churches are up to. I can text. I can email. I mean, I can send you this video quite easily from several hundred kilometers away to help you prepare for the Sunday morning. These churches were connected. They knew one another when they either had to travel or send a letter. That was pretty much it. They couldn't call one another up, but they knew one another and they encouraged one another because they needed that. Encouragement is so, so key. You've been there. I've been there. You've got, you know what, you're feeling down you're feeling down and someone you know and love comes by and they just say, you know what? I see what you're up to. I see what God is doing. You're doing a great job. You're going to get there. I care about you. Press on. Man, as as pastors, we need that. For churches, we need that. And I hope that's what I've been able to do for you folks because I'm I'm being honest. Like I see so many good things and you need to hear that because oftentimes when we're engaged in the muck, it's hard to see. And so God has given you as well, in order to go far together, God has given you a call. How will you encourage other believers in other churches? Maybe it's a church down the street. Maybe it's one of our MB churches in Ottawa. Maybe it's a, another, who knows, right? You build these relationships. You offer that encouragement to spur one another along the way. We will be healthier. It's like wind in the sails for the next day to refresh each other's spirits. That's what Paul said happened here. His spirit was refreshed. Who is God calling you to refresh their spirit? And this idea of greeting 
one another warmly as we grow into these relationships that go far. May we greet one another warmly because we need that encouragement. Just before I close here, I want to share one more story with you. We actually have a pretty remarkable story unfolding among us as ONMB. Um, this is a story of Obed Rod, and he's from the Jesus Network, which is one of our ministries in the GTA uh, connected with ONMB. And so in the month of August, we all saw the tragic takeover of the city of Kabul in Afghanistan. You know, we were watching the news and saw the chaotic scenes at the airport. And uh, I remember watching it just feeling numb. Like, how can this be happening? Oh my goodness. Like, just painful. Just painful. And here in the GTA, we have a fellow named Obed Rod. He was born into Islam. He was trained under an extremist group. He studied to become an imam. But then Jesus met him and transformed his life. So he lived in secret as a Christian in Afghanistan for four years. He escaped to India. He planted an Afghan church in India. He came to Canada in 2015. And then he planted the first known church in Canada, sharing the gospel widely. And so now he has a broad network of connections in Afghanistan. He's in communication with many as the, the Taliban took over Kabul. And his Afghan church in Toronto has sent financial support through secret channels to 70 families in Afghanistan to help them survive through the current hardship. They played a key role in evacuating 571 Afghans, 275 believers to another country to live in a refugee camp. They've helped another 130 Afghan believers escape to another camp where they're now being cared for by another British organization. They've sponsored eight Afghani families who have come now to Canada. In December, I was with Sean and Haley Cuthill. They're the directors of the Jesus Network. I was hoping to meet Obed, but he was too busy getting ready for this first family that was going to be settling there from, they were just arriving uh, to Canada. He was too, he was too busy. And, and Haley jokes about, she, she's so worried about Obed because he's so busy and God's at work through him and he's just running like 90 and she carries aspirin around in her purse in case he has a heart attack so she can feed him a few aspirin and get him get him going now i mean just kidding around but seeing the incredible burden that this fellow carries for his afghan people that they would be free from the chaos that they would be safe and secure but most of all that they would meet jesus this is kingdom stuff god at work among and through our onmb family uh, yeah, so exciting. And so, you know, we can we can go far with Obed together on his own. It's quite possible that in a year of going hard, he might burn out. He might not get as much done on his own, but together we can go far. So how can we cheer them on? How can we support them financially? How can we learn from them as maybe we would settle Afghani refugees in our communities? Obed might go fast alone, but together with this broad community of people around him, Obed is able to go far for the glory of God as he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I offer an invitation to you to join with other churches to go far for the gospel of Jesus within the Ontario Conference of MB churches, but also with other churches around you from other denominations. I believe Southeast City, as you get used to settle into our family in ONMB, I think that you have something to offer. We have things to learn from you. God wants to inform us, encourage us, strengthen us through your presence and your witness with us. I am a more faithful disciple of Jesus when I'm being encouraged, strengthened, and inspired by you and our other churches. May we go far together rather than fast alone. And as I mentioned earlier, I can guarantee you that if you decide to partner, if you decide, I want to go far together, you will not get as much done this week. You'll have a few more things on your to-do list that didn't get stroked off but you will go farther. You will have greater kingdom impact over the long haul. As we feed into one another, we will be spiritually healthy and stronger. Let's lean in. Let's go far together. Let's hear the stories. Let's make the connections. Let's pray for each other. God did not intend for you to live out your faith as an individual, but as a part of a team. And so I leave that with you as an invitation to go far together. And I look forward to seeing how that will unfold in the years ahead. As I finish up here, I apologize if you're hearing some commotion behind me. My kids just got home from school and uh, such is the nature of working at home in these days. I was hoping to get done before they got home, but that didn't quite happen. Uh, hopefully it's not too 
disruptive. So thanks again for this opportunity to be with you. I wish, I pray for God's blessing on you. If I could just take a moment and pray over you, that would be, that would be great as well. God, we lift our hearts to you. Thank you for who you are, your presence in our lives. Thank you for the witness of other people around us that have brought us to this point that we are in our faith journey of knowing you. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. And thank you for your family, the global, historic people of God, um, this body united under Jesus as our King. Thank you for them and how we get to be a part of them and sustain them. And I pray that you would give us vision for how we can go far together, inspire us. Holy Spirit, you know from this message what we need to receive. You know the parts that need to fall away and the parts that we need to chew on, the parts that need to resonate within our hearts. So we surrender ourselves to your leadership that you would do that within us. I pray that you would bless Southeast City. I pray that you would bless David and Diana, that you would heal them, strengthen them, we love you, God, and we want more of you in our lives. In the power of your name, Jesus, we pray all of this. Amen. All right, thanks again for this time together. Look forward to when we cross paths next. Take care.